Welcome to episode nine of the Critical Coach podcast. If you want to support me, you can do so by getting some gear from the website, thecriticalcoach.com forward slash shop, or simply share my content on your social media platform of choice, whether that's articles from the website or podcast episodes, everything helps. Um, If you enjoy the podcast, follow it on Spotify, subscribe on YouTube, or give it five stars on Apple Podcasts. Um, Now, I've finally got some new content out that's not another podcast episode. Uh, The next article on exercise hierarchies is finally out. Sorry it took so long. Uh, Part one introduced the concept of an exercise hierarchy and how we can define complex exercises in simpler terms. Part 2a that's just come out develops that process to define and understand the relationships between exercises. Part 2b will look at practical applications for that knowledge. Right, in this episode, I'm back talking to Joe Matthews and Al Buttermore, co-directors of Real Fit Strength and Conditioning. We talk about motivation and discipline, how to get involved in powerlifting, and how gym equipment has changed over time. Head over to realfit.com.au forward slash shop, and that's fit with two T's, and check out a range of true protein supplements and Real Fit training programs for hip resilience, shoulder resilience, beginner swimming, speed and conditioning, and their ebook, Strength and Power Development for Athletes. Cheers. Got a viewer question from Tammy. Uh, how do you help keep try again? How do you help keep clients motivated and enthusiastic about their training when they don't appear to be reaching their goals? How do you help them stay motivated? Do you want to kick it off, Al? Sure. Um, so f- I think first of all. Motivation is um, fleeting. So the, the issue of keeping motivated is not really, not the issue, but motivation doesn't last. So it's keeping the client committed and on and engaged with the process. And if you can do that, then they should hopefully achieve their goals. And then of course, it depends on what the goals are. If they set realistic goals and the processes that's been you've set in place are going to get them to those goals. Um, so keeping them committed and engaged, I think is more to the point than keeping them motivated because you can't keep motivation. Yeah, you're yeah, going to have bad motivate. days when you yep. don't want to do it. Yep, and that goes for anything. Yep, yeah. but in particular, yeah. Because yep. they're essentially trying to commit to a process of change, taking themselves from point A to point B, which means changing their equilibrium, or changing their, their set point, and that is uncomfortable, and people don't like being uncomfortable. So it's getting them into that, um, getting them into, uh, into a pathway that will take them on that journey and keeping them on that pathway is the challenge. Joe, anything you want to add to that? I agree with Al. i would probably just offer up the analogy of, you know, your day-to-day professional career. You're not always going to be motivated to rock up and love what you're doing, but you'll turn up because of discipline and you know what getting the work done does for your life. It allows you to live the life that you live, to pay your bills, to do X, Y, Z, gives you options and choices. And training's the same. Like Ben Ben spoke about it in a podcast about discipline actually being the, I guess, the most common denominator in longevity when it comes to your training. Because like Al said, you'll go through lulls in motivation. But if you're disciplined enough to turn up and you know why you're turning up because of what it's going to allow you to do in your life um, in terms of having a functional, strong body that gives you options, you can climb a mountain, you can go on a ride, you can go on a hike, you can ride a motorbike, you can do all these things um, that allow you to live a, a, a happier, more fulfilled life, if you like, if you're disciplined enough to turn up even when the motivation is lacking. And sometimes, you know, you set goals for certain things and for all intents and purposes, you can achieve those goals, but then life happens. You know, you've got to go away, you have an injury. You need to be willing to make amendments to your goal, uh, to make adjustments and changes if you like And then once you're back to where you need to be, you can then go for those same goals again. So yes, I think it's normal 
to, to lose motivation, especially when you're not getting to where you want to be. Um, and don't think that that's, that's it then. Pack up, pack up my bags and quit. Because if you do that, then you got no chance. Yeah, then you're definitely not getting there. That's right. And and for for people that play team sports, for example, you lose motivation to train sometimes. But if you just pack your bags and you you quit, <laughs> that's it. You know, you, there's no there's no. I mean, you can come back at a later time when you feel more motivated. But that same process is going to happen. And if you keep doing the same thing you're gonna get the same results. Yeah, so it's yeah. important to be disciplined even when you are lacking motivation. And if you're doing that in a team sport, your teammates probably won't wanna play with you for very long if you only do it when it's easy for you. 100% agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I think the other thing too, the, the person has to enjoy, has to at some level enjoy the process. Yes. Because if you are gonna grow, if like for instance, weight loss is a classic. So people like the idea of losing 10, 15 kilos. But then the process of doing that requires dropping, you know, moving more, dropping calories, looking at your diet, looking at why you eat the way you do, addressing emotional issues, all the other things that, that have to be unpacked. And if people aren't going to enjoy that process, it's going to be very, very difficult, yeah. no matter what level of motivation you have. I got a piece of advice from a friend of mine, uh, it had to be almost 10 years ago now, and it was one of those things... I wish someone had told me right at the start of my army career because it just reframed um, the way I thought about that stuff. He said, no one cares about how you perform when things are easy. Mm. If once it gets difficult, then people are paying attention to see what kind of character you've got. Like it's easier to be, you know, a fun, enthusiastic, motivated person when there's really nothing for you to um, deal with and overcome. It's no when struggle. it's, yeah, there's, there's no struggle. So there's nothing particularly, you know, anyone can be having a good time when there's no excuse to have a bad time, but when shit's difficult um, and people, you know, really have to force themselves to do something despite you know, emotionally sort of telling themselves this is a terrible idea, that's what shows character. I literally read about this the other day on a, a thing on Instagram called Building the Elite. It's a couple of coaches in America, they specialize in special operations, training special operations people. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about people training in gyms or, you know, um, and they, they're operating, they're training and they're operating in basically perfect conditions. And it doesn't count for much out when you're actually, I mean, it's relating to the military world, yeah, but yeah, yeah, it doesn't count for anything. The fact that you can squat a hundred kilos in a gym doesn't mean, doesn't mean shit. If you mm. can't carry a rucksack up a, under fire and like under pressure, under emotional pressure. Yeah, and it's, all it's easy. It's, it's easy to get someone. I mean, on paper, it's easy to get someone physically to the point where they can do really difficult tasks. Mm. Um, but to get them to do it when they're tired and wet, and miserable yeah. is that's what you're really looking for. There's, I don't think it gets used much anymore, but there used to be something called a sickener that was thrown into um, whether it was just unit physical training or uh, selection for certain things. And a sickener was a task that was impossible to complete comfortably. Mm -hmm. So it would be uh, carry an ammo box that weighs 60 kilos that has one handle and it's on the side. So you can't carry it comfortably. One person carry. can hold the handle, <laughs> but you can't, there's no handle for the other side. So you're gonna constantly be moving the thing around. It's just gonna suck yeah. to carry it all the time. Or, I mean, you can do similar stuff in the gym, like, um, you know, instead of doing a normal farmer's carry, get two really heavy wall balls or med balls and yeah. carry them like barrels under your arms. There's, it's such a, it's, it's difficult to hold them there to begin with. Um, and it's just uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's kind of the point. Yeah. Yeah. There was one other thing I wanted to add, if I can uh, remember what it is. Uh, so I'm talking about um, uh, motivation, getting people to stick uh, with their goals um, and you were sort of using the analogy of work mm -hmm. um, but if you're if you're a client and you're working with a new coach for the first time 
how do you know you're going to get paid at the end of the work week or get the goals that you're um, after with that coach? So from the coach's side, they need to manage the expectations right off the bat yeah. so that, you know, they're they have realistic expectations of, you know, how difficult something might be. Um, but they also have to seem credible straight away so that they will push through that initial period of discomfort because they think you're credible enough that if they hang in there, they'll get to their goals. Um, and if the cl if you're working with a client who's uh, might be a little more you know, sensitive and might need a little bit more handholding, it might be worthwhile injecting a smaller goal that they can achieve in the short term, just so they've got a milestone to hold on to and you can show them that they've made some some progress. Yeah, absolutely. And I think little things that coaches can do with new people that they're taking on, I mean, they can get DEXA scans done, for instance. I mean, they're not 100% accurate, but what assessment is, it just gives you some benchmarks to work towards other than weight on a bar. Can you explain what a DEXA scan oh, shows people? Gives you your body fat percentage, reading how hydrated you are, um, how much lean body mass and lean muscle mass you're carrying. And you, know, you could get one of them done every 12 weeks for instance, to see how you're trending. These are little things. People, other, other coaches may take measurements, skin folds, yep. things of this nature. Um, it just depends on what the client's goal is, right? And what you were saying, uh, referring back to a new person is um, great. And I think that for those of you that have been training people for a lot longer, how do, you, how do you take on the challenge of someone that's losing motivation because they're not getting the goals that they want? Well, a conversation has to be had. 100%. And you have to communicate with that person and dig a little deeper. What's going on, okay? Um, and, and I don't mean that in a condescending way. Is, you know, it's more of an, are you okay? Tell me, tell me where you're at and let's try and figure, figure this out. And maybe we do need to make some adjustments to the current goals and make them a little bit smaller to get some wins up and build you back up. And being proactive Correct. in like engaging them in a conversation, you sort of worry, you know, maybe the client's catastrophizing in the sense that they're uh, making the problem out to Definitely. be bigger and less Definitely. attainable than they think it is. Yep. Um, and then when they say it out loud and maybe you can give it some context is oh, okay maybe it's not as bad i mean maybe it is exactly yeah. as bad as they think it yeah. is but at least then you know about it you can exactly. say all right i'm going to come back to you in like a day two days with a plan so yeah. they feel like they're not just sort of out there treading water it cuts on their out own. the guesswork and you're not there going oh i don't know where they're at you know at least you've asked and if you don't ask you don't get yeah and it empowers them as well to for that opportunity to sort of say what's on their mind and where their their heads at and then you can move can attempt to move forward from there and if you've got a long-term relationship with that person then there you know you should be able to have that conversation yeah so if we were going to summarize it it'd be well so as a coach you've you've got to be credible to begin with there's got to be you know you've got to be credible in the sense that they're going to trust you um you need to talk to them about what their goals are and ask them what they think the process is gonna be like. So you can manage their expectations of, you know, not just the plausibility of the goal, but you know, how difficult it might be um, along the way. And then once you start that process, don't just, leave them hanging, you gotta engage with them from time to time and see how they're traveling so you can sort of get ahead of a, a problem that's starting to snowball rather yeah. than waiting until it's sort of snowballed to the point where- uh, It's not recoverable. Yeah, all you're really doing at that point is triage rather yeah. than than prevention. Yeah. Okay. But uh, our, our, what Al said in the beginning too is get them back focused on the process. Oh yeah. Because yeah. if they're, if they're looking ahead to the outcome, 
then and experiencing those feelings of achieving that outcome but they're nowhere <laughs> near it you've got to get them back on a more on a micro than a macro level you can refer back to that macro outcome every now and again but you you do you do need to be disciplined and committed to the process as well something else we didn't touch on which is interesting is that and that old why thing like with the goals people have these yeah. arbitrary goals or you know not you know they just have a goal for instance but what is why is that goal important and i think a lot of people have a superficial attachment to some sort of goal especially in body composition weight loss kind of world it's like well why do you why do you want to have look like that what why, what does that give you or like a strength goal like why do you need to squat that what does that mean for you what does that give you and if they can't get past if they can't sort of give you an answer on that then maybe there needs to be a reflection on what the actual goal is yeah it sort of signals Absolutely. that maybe yeah. because they're if, not going to be that you committed squat, to it like if you because I, I did this myself i was like well i saw everyone else in the gym here squatting 180 plus 200 200 plus i was like well i need to get my squat up and but i didn't actually want to get my squat up because what did it mean for me nothing yeah. And so every time it got hard, I would find a reason not to do. So I know now. Or become demotivated. Well, I get demotivated yeah. with it. And then when the grind comes and I'm now having to do singles at 90% plus, and I just don't want to do it. I just do not want to do it. And I, I can grind myself through these things, but it wasn't important to me and it wasn't relevant to what I wanted to do. And I worked that out eventually the hard way. And I think sometimes people need to have that same conversation with themselves and with their coach. What is it you're actually trying to do here? Yeah. And, and the why? Why is it that yeah, you're yeah, actually yeah. Well, that's trying what I mean, to do? Sorry, it. the why? Yeah. Why are you trying to do what you you know? What is it that it actually means? And that should tell you uh, what their motivation is. Mm. And they're like, oh, I don't want to do it because it's hard. Yeah. You've they've essentially given you the answer to the question. Yeah. And if they at that point they go, oh, I actually don't want it that it's much. That yeah. 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 And that's uh, I mean that that could open up segue into a massive conversation about ego yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and the impact that it actually has on uh, on the why. Um, but in reality, I think we've spoken about this a couple of times, you know, what you've got to think, yeah, short term, you might want these things, but long term, you want to have your health and functionality for as long as you can, right? Wouldn't that outweigh this, if not, you're willing to make the sacrifices that need to happen to get this thing in the short term, at least you're aware of the consequences. Yeah, yeah as long as you're not There's going into There's options to get short-term goals. Yeah. yeah. There are plenty of options to get something real quick. But they might have a trade-off. They have a very trade-off. And you have to be they comfortable with the trade-off. And you have to be comfortable with the trade-off yeah. and getting the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Or the trade-off and maybe still not getting the goal. Yeah, it's entirely possible. Like, um, uh, you know, if someone's going for a job, it's like, like investing. Yeah, yeah, you get rich real quick. But what's you could your risk tolerance? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. You could lose it. You could lose it all, or you could. Yeah, lots could happen. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else we want to add about uh, motivation? I th I think you've summarised it pretty well, and just just for people to understand that there will be lulls in motivation. And sometimes if you can sort of keep turning up and be committed and disciplined to the process, you'll get past that. But sometimes you may need to make adjustments to the goal after talking with your coach about the why or, or a trusted, somebody you trust about the why, maybe it's not what you need. Maybe it's just what you want. Yeah. Maybe it'll get you back to what you need and then refocus, reset and give it another crack. Okay. But don't give up. Keep turning up. Um, Al, do you want to talk a bit about uh, powerlifting at the gym? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have, um, so the gym real fit is the ACT, um, I guess affiliate might be the word, for the um, APU, Australian Powerlifting Union, which is the IPF, International Powerlifting. It's the only Australian one that's associated with IPF, now, correct. correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the the one that's linked with the SAR, it's not called ASADA, what's it called now? Uh something it's the only sports drug integrity sports unit integrity australia, unit, australia yeah, i yeah. think it is so it's loosely linked with sports australia which is the um, older sada yeah and okay, whatever you said the older sada um so we have the act state titles coming up in a couple of uh, sorry on the 22nd of august um which due to covid is going to be very different this year so basically the the athletes will come in they'll lift and 
and leave. There'll be no fanfare, no spectators, no coaches, no, no nothing. But if you are interested in getting involved, we're always looking um, for new lifters or for people that want to um, – to come in and compete and, and see how they go. It's very friendly. Um, the process is pretty simple. Um, you can train from any gym, it doesn't matter. You have to live in the ACT at this stage or Queanbeyan. Yeah, Queanbeyan. Yeah, Queanbeyan as well, yeah. Possibly the South Coast. Yeah, we're working we're, we're on working it. On it. Um, but you can uh, compete in a local event, which we run here at Real Fit normally at the start of the year in that sort of February kind of time frame. And then once you compete in the local event, there's different totals that you need to achieve. But if you had a C grade title, and you can find this all online, um, then you can entitles you to compete at state titles. And then if you hit a B grade total, then that entitles you to be up for selection for the ACT team to go to nationals. If you do well at nationals, then you're open to be selected for the Australian team. So it's pretty cool. So it follows a progression. It follows essentially the same progression that all the Olympic sports follow. Um, so they're trying to align with Sports Australia and follow the exact same processes. And it's quite good because it means um, it's very clear how you make a team. So, so if anyone wants to get involved, um, do you know where they need to go off the top of your head or you want me to put it in the... Like notes just, for it just contact me okay yep, so just contact much. yep yep all right i'll, I'll so chuck I'll your email on. Yep. i'll chuck your email into yep. the notes yep. um is there anything else you want to add uh, up to yeah i think it's it'd be fair to say there's several different federations that you can compete in but for powerlifting for powerlifting <clears throat> yeah at the moment you know um there's probably the the main two that you'll see hear about possibly watch on social media would be the international powerlifting federation and the Global Powerlifting GPC Committee. committee. Um, now, with with the IPF, um, the the way it works is they've basically got two categories. You've got an equipped category and a raw category. And obviously, here in Australia, the federation that's subject to testing, as Al was uh, drug testing, uh, as Al was mentioning before is um, the APU. Yep, there are under the IPF. Under the IPF. There are other federations as well that are also subject to testing, uh, but possibly their testing comes from uh, an independent party that they, yeah. that they pay to do the testing for their um, lifters. But I think the, the great thing about powerlifting in general is that it's a sport that most people can do forever um, and the training you know there's not a you have to be tuesday thursday at you know 6 p.m which is what a lot of sports are, or, or uh, monday wednesday friday and you have to play on the weekend or whatever you can train at whatever time suits you and like al said there's a very clear pathway for progression if it's something you've got a natural aptitude for and you, and you find that um you're quite good at and you get quite motivated to do. Um, and if people are a bit, you know, anxious about the idea of doing it in front of a crowd, this might actually be a perfect opportunity for them to it's dip their toes in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I agree. Because there's going to be no one there Didn't even you know, think of that, but to yep. watch it because of the lockdown. So it's definitely about as low pressure as it's going to get. It's very friendly. Yeah. It looks sometimes on social media, especially the pro raw events that you, that you see look terrifying and, a lot of the American events are very G'd up and everything, but all the local events here, like a sober, it doesn't matter what federation, they're all very friendly. Yeah, I agree. Can you explain the difference between uh, the raw and equipped? Uh, okay, so in raw powerlifting, there are some aids that you're allowed to use, a belt, uh, knee sleeves and wrist wraps. Yeah, so and they're pretty specific. Knee sleeve. Like you'd have to go to the IPF or APU website probably to find out what those... I specifics are yeah the i the ipf sanction a group of different brands um that you're allowed to wear in competition so you'd have to check that the brand you're buying is actually um ipf approved uh and the equipped is um basically a single ply suit um with knee wraps wrist straps yeah but belts what's what's the effect of the suit because when i see people getting it like it looks like it's it's kind of like putting on a knee sleeve for 80 percent of your body it's a, it's a great a great analogy and 
I, I would even go so far as to say it's actually a bit tougher than that. Imagine a knee sleeve that's two sizes too small for you and trying to get that on. Um, yeah, it's normally like a two, three person job to get someone can be. into, you know, if they're a big person, you can't just hoik them up off the ground. Um, it's a bit of effort to get someone in. Correct, and a lot of the time you'll see people um, sort of hanging off a power rack with one sleeve hanging off the power rack so they can drop into their their suit. There's multi-ply suits, which you'll see in other federations, but in the IPF, it's a single ply okay. suit. And yeah, it is it is similar to the analogy you were just mentioning, but it actually makes, for instance, the squat really, really uh, technical. I would say more technical than raw, because you have to actually, if you want to utilize the suit to its fullest, you need to, you need to be very, very, good with your form and technique. Uh, in, in terms of um, not coming off your line on the way in and out of the hole. Because if you come off your line, the suit just makes it more so. So the bar path will just go exactly with the direction the suit's driving. Yeah, okay, so you pay a high, you, you get the potential to get a bit of help getting out of the bottom, but if you, do that in a technically flawed way, yeah. the suit's gonna help you get out of the bottom, but it's gonna send you in directions you don't really wanna go to get back up. Yeah, and and I mean, if the weight isn't heavy enough, you'll find it hard to even get into the bottom Yeah, because the suit's that tight. Okay. Now, if people, uh, you know, people might be, like Al was saying, there's, you see some videos online that sort of can make it seem a bit intimidating. I suspect if people have any, um, exposure to powerlifting, I'd say there's a high likelihood that it's through something like Westside Barbell um, and either seeing like documentaries about them and Louis Simmons, um, oh, but yeah. they're not doing, yeah. generally, they're not doing IPF stuff, are they? They're doing like multiply suits. Um, from what I understand, they tend to work in um, leagues that don't test or have pretty limited testing. And they've also, they're using knee wraps yeah. And the knee wraps, I mean, depending on the lifter you talk to, can give you 25, 50 kilos plus. Yeah. Without, without a suit. Okay. Didn't give me that. <laughs> <laughs> what did give you sore knees? Sore knees. That's the question whether you, you wrap <laughs> sore knees and blood blisters. Um, but yeah, I think it was 2010, you had the advent of the raw division. And then. I, I would say that powerlifting just pretty much exploded. Oh, we should probably explain what the exercises are. It's three lifts. It's a squat. barbell back squat, yep. a bench press, and a deadlift. And you can do that as a conventional deadlift or as a sumo. Yeah, and you get deadlift. in competition, you'll get three attempts of each. I'll take your best one and they'll add the three up. And that'll give you your total. Correct. Okay. Um, so. That's happening on the 22nd of August yep. here. Yep. Um, and if people are interested in it, they want to get involved, they need to email you. I'll, I'll write it down we so won't, I don't have to spell we won't, it Yeah, out. we won't have any, we can't have any spectators or anything this event, but moving forward, hopefully if things ease up, then yes, it's a free, you know, it's a more, everyone's more than welcome to come along and have a look. Okay, cool. So we've got, we've got 14 minutes left until we hit our hard deadline. Um, do we want to try and talk about equipment in that time? Oh. We'll just start going and if we need to pick it up another time, we can do that. Yeah. So do you, do you want to lay that out or do you want me to read out the bit oh, that you put out in the email? We, we basically were talking about how um, equipment has sort of evolved over the years in the fitness industry and in the strength and conditioning world. But, um, you know, prior to sort of 2010, you weren't like the, the common, well, Al, what, what are some of the common equipment that you would have seen in commercial gyms? Because there wasn't a whole lot of private gyms prior to 2010. There, there was a handful, but it wasn't, there wasn't a lot like there is now. Like what's the sort of equipment that you would see in a commercial gym? And I'll, 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 I'll get into this as well. Well, I think a lot of the commercial gyms were focused on that kind of like bodybuilding style of training so you had i remember the gym at, i was at in christchurch had hammer strength machines everywhere um isolation machines you could have a machine for anything um 
Cable machines. Uh, cable machines. machines. Yeah. Yep. Everything was a machine. Um, and then, the, the, like, for the as far as strength training goes, the, the big ones were the, obviously your bench press racks, but leg press. Um, Fucking hate that machine. Which so, one? The 45? 45, 90, yeah. Yeah. The 45. I love, I love them. Well, it's interesting <laughs> because they initially developed that 90 as a um, rehab machine and then it becomes all of a sudden people loading it up yeah. Yeah. as a strength, you know, as a genuine strength yeah, If you're machine. a rugby player and you get getting into a scrum, it's yeah, it had probably- some application. Yeah. yeah. We had speed skaters at the course I was on and they used to do single leg um, leg press with ridiculous. ridiculous amounts of weights and it was that's the 45 yeah. degree yeah yeah and they would do it slow so they'd be like like that and then it was explode so like a slow with, eccentric yeah and then explode. I remember watching yeah. I was like how did knees not snapping but anyway yeah. yeah so it was mostly like machines and then machines yeah, you had free weights and out. it was just dumbbells and barbells yeah 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 so you still had your dumbbells barbells bench presses those sort of things but you didn't see like what a lot of what you see now no you might get a yoga ball. Actually, they weren't around for a long time. They sort of came in. You mean the Swiss ball? Yes, the Swiss, Swiss, Swiss ball, ball yeah. which, which would be, oh, the fucking Bosu balls. Um, would have been like, what, early 2000s or something. You start to see some of that stuff whole, come in. Whole, it, it used to be. So back in the, initially, like back in the turn of the century kind of things, it was all like calisthenics and like high school gymnasium type stuff mm -hmm. like those rings and bars and stuff that you'd hang off and like hold, like pull the horses that you jump over and yeah like play type stuff, rings, sort of stuff. and it's it's like fashion though a lot of that's come it's back in hasn't it the 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 climbing boards yep. what were they called again peg the, boards. yeah the peg boards all yeah that sort of stuff ring gymnastics rings all that sort of stuff and then it went to like aerobics in the 80s I'm probably skipping out a whole generation here. You had like all the barbell, all the barbell oh, stuff was yeah, really popular. Yeah, you got all the cardio equipment. Then Completely you, then forgot we, about that. Full aerobics. Yeah. I'm talking about commercial gyms anyway. Like um, bikes, treadmills, bike, steppers. treadmills, and then you had aerobics classes with the steps. Everything was done with the steps. Oh step. yeah, that's yeah, like yeah, the you, old Jane Fonda stuff. Yeah, it was excellent. I wish you'd come back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it went like the bodybuilding way. So as Arnie picked up popularity and, and that, that world, and then so you had machines, and then obviously then it became very commercial because those machines are worth a fortune. And um, then you had like sales reps for the machine. Did you get those guys coming yeah, out? Yeah, like absolutely. Try and set your whole gym up and yeah. give you a little bit of a discount. All that. I mean, you could get machines with a thousand things in one. Not really, but you know. It's just more things ten, to break. Ten, thi <laughs> 10 things in one. But uh, it was in the 90s, it was just really common. You'd see sort of, in a gym was very masculine a lot of men spandex pants no shirt getting around that wasn't uncommon at all um but we sort of i think progressed past that um in in the sort of early 2000s the equipment didn't change but the people did yeah the people the people definitely um changed and in terms of in a commercial gym like al said and not um speaking specifically about aerobics training that was very very popular in the 80s but yeah the kind of equipment that was in the gyms was really what al said you know uh, majority was uh, focused around hammer strength machines and cable pulley systems uh, and then sort of around 2005 2006 here in canberra we started to see the introduction of things like um sleds, uh, reverse hyper machines, ropes, farmer's walks, yokes, atlas stones. Yeah. And what was the catalyst for, for these things coming yeah. in? I think, I think people, uh, I think the internet yeah. is a lot and social media. Um, I would have thought no social media. Would have been like, well, yeah, not then, but yeah, the internet and people being able to sort of have- They start to educate themselves. Yeah. And, and CrossFit starting to- CrossFit was a few years later, but so yeah, well, it, it brought it back the no shirt, didn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I mean, you sort of get like uh, Commando Steve on that biggest lo biggest loser was what it was, wasn't it? Yeah. And you see, it like, that's some weird equipment I haven't seen before, or yeah. like just flipping tires yeah. or dragging a rope down a beach or something like that. Because people have access to information. Two thousand five, instead of going to the library to look up Louis yeah. Simmons' butt, which you're not going to do, but people would then see someone like yeah, Commando Steve. He's got his He's 
fit, jacked. He's ticking all those boxes that what people actually want and then they see what he's doing and then he's flipping tires. He's not on a machine, he's flipping tires and he's doing rope slams and burpees and so then they start to put two and two together. So I must have to do those exercises yeah. Yeah, if yeah, I yeah, want to yeah. look like that. And then it all explodes when you have um, CrossFit take center stage for a while there and you had all these people doing crazy things with different bits. And of the gear. commercial gyms followed suit. Yeah. And yeah. now it's uncommon sort of not to see a sled track, um, a yoke, farmer's walks, kettlebells, ropes in any commercial gym it's now. It's almost a, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a I stock mean, standard a like while. cables and. They were very slow. Yeah. But then some of them, some of the big CrossFit ones. boxes were popping up. Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Um, and every now and again, you know, I'd be traveling somewhere and I'd go into a commercial gym and they'd like, I'd have to do kettlebell swings with a dumbbell. Yeah. Because, and this is, you know, 2010s. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then it just it turned within a matter, like, matter of years. Yeah. 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 Well, they had to because then, so Fitness First seemed to have struggled and like a few of them, the bigger ones, haven't been able to adapt. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you mean? Well, they don't have, they, they relied on huge volumes of people. Um, they had huge floor spaces in places like, well, in, I know in Perth, they had Hay Street. They had this huge, like right in the middle of the city. You there was a huge one in Canberra in Civic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Massive so the, floor space their covered rent, in machines. Their, their rent would be... Astronomical. Astronomical. Like they need thousands of people. And then if the people are starting to trickle away, they're bleeding by a thousand cuts as people go off to to um, CrossFit boxes or to private studios or to, you know, um, to whatever other training option they're going to. Yoga Pilates is another one that's had a huge boom. Yeah, Pilates sort of started to come around in the 90s and like uh, late night Especially you know, in advertisements in the and urban, stuff. In the urban environments, like you go in inner city Melbourne, inner city Sydney, Brisbane, there's yoga studios everywhere. Pilates studios, that's huge. Do you think the that um, the big sort of uh, global gyms like Fitness First, um, you know, their failure to respond quickly enough to the change in demand mm. actually led to the proliferation of private gyms um, at a higher level? Yeah, level because they just they have it. It it you, would have they the equipment they have the special knowledge there's low barrier to entry for the private for that small private gym so you can go and rent 100 square meters you can spend a few grand and get started i think that so the, that, the, that the private setup easy. was always going to happen yeah whether or not the the big gyms suffered or not um, so what what do you think kicked it off i mean well, it's I, hard I, to I, put I, my I, finger on what kicked it off but what i think you know in terms of you know the the rest of the industry does have a lot to thank crossfit for yeah I've... bringing this stuff to the mainstream and people looking at it and going i've been training over in this but i like that i'm going to set up my own thing yeah i wonder whether and then you, spin offs off that whether you can call it like the rise of the garage gym because that's a, that was a big part like if you went on to the crossfit journal which for anyone who's not familiar with it is not a peer-reviewed journal um it's just their you know blog magazine online thing um and you go to the crossfit website and there'd be like pictures of people's home gyms um and community became a part of going to the gym um, sort of again tied to um, CrossFit but I sort of wonder whether by showing people how much variation you could get with a relatively um, simple uh, collection of equipment people like oh the barrier to entry for opening up my own gym might actually be a lot lower yeah. than I thought it was. Yeah, and I think, I mean, this is delving into it, but um, having access to all of this stuff, which is still, to, just to look at it on face value, looks really cool and really interesting and it's functional and it has good transference if used correctly to performance, um, keeps people interested. Yeah, I think that's... You know, and, and satiates that sort of motivation we were talking yeah, about before. Yeah. I think that's probably more, a, a bigger part of it than people would give it 
credit for that if all you've got are, you know, hammer strength machines, cable machines, dumbbells, and some pretty crappy barbells, then you're probably gonna end up using a Smith machine anyway. That can get real boring mm, real quickly. Boring. Yeah. And having varied equipment, at least, you know, it makes it a little bit easier to stay engaged. A lot of people too are, like uh, with that sort of stuff, you with that machine environment and the commercial gym environment, you sort of it's you against yourself. If that makes sense. Yeah. Whereas when you're in a, like community, was one you just briefly touched on. I think is massive because mm. when you're in a community, you're bouncing off other people are doing similar things. You're if not competing, like you might be doing a wad for it, like at a CrossFit box. Yeah, you're, you're essentially are, racing. You're racing. So people have come out of team sport. That is very attractive. Yeah. Like for me, that oh, I love that. Like I think that's. Oh awesome. yeah, because it adds like that mixture of pride and shame yeah. to the equation. Yeah. People yeah. like you know I don't want to look like a bag of shit in front of these people who I hang out with at the gym. I, I think I think powerful. you're both yeah. nailing this on the head. Like when when you look at um, the machines that we've been discussing, the classic machines that were sort of the 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 stock and standard for commercial gyms the bodybuilding world these guys and girls work super super hard and they're intrinsically they're, driven they are the level of discipline is just level, ridiculous yeah, it's through the roof it's and hours a day every day every day not, a not whole just lot of in the gym it's the it's what they do outside of the gym in terms of their nutrition their hydration their recovery uh, their sleep. Vitamin S. <laughs> well, depends on the federation, but <laughs> yeah. that's arguable as well. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, they're, they're super, super dedicated to their craft. And what people see in terms of on the stage, that's the end product. The process is very uh, sort of dry and repetitive. And yeah, exactly why we're seeing success yeah, in these. So it sort of um, like narrows the yeah. long-term appeal to a Correct. very select group Exactly of what you were saying. And people are seeing now you can get 80%, 80 to 90% of the way to the way these people look by doing a mix of strength training, high intensity training, you know, like whatever the, you know, you can, you can jumble it all up and get most of the way there in terms of like that aesthetic look. Yeah, you can get lean, and you, you can, can bring lean. out the best of your genetics strong. in many you, other you ways. You can get a yeah. lot of the you can get a lot of the results by doing it's kind of fun turn, things. Yeah, yeah, turn the gym into a buffet, whereas like you know if you don't like the seafood, you don't have to eat it. Right. There's yeah. other stuff. You know, if if all you want to do is dumbbells, barbells, and machines, there's a place for you to go and do that. To the point where sometimes in if if we're using um seafood as an analogy for cable and hammer strength to the point where there is no seafood in that buffet at all whether yeah. you want it or not so many gyms we might have a shellfish have allergy yeah. <laughs> for an allergy to atlas stones and yolks correct cool so we've hit our time limit is there anything else you want to chuck in there before we wrap up mm. No, I think, well, just on that equipment thing, I think you know how everything, it is cyclical. So at the moment, people are- That's what you are saying before, there's a fashion aspect to yeah, it. Yeah, there, there is. And I think the, the calisthenics thing is, especially with COVID is sort of gonna start to, like you'll see people, like, people are realizing that they can do um, body weight work. They can do, you know, like, so it's gonna add more strings to the- You to think? The, prison training regimes are going to yeah, come yeah, back yeah. into like popularity. High body weight training, like there's a place for that. And gyms will accommodate, like we can accommodate that here with the rigs and the um, some of the gear. Like there's a lot of, yeah, I think there's a lot of, uh, and there's a lot of options there. Yeah. It's funny too now because, sorry, the, the training, like I was reading about this a while ago, training, physical training used to be like PT or that sort of thing, used to be keeping your body mobile and fresh so you could do the things that you needed to do. So, it would be star jumps, it'd be toe touches, it'd be like j just hip bends, it'd be all sorts of just stuff just to, to keep the body moving so that you could then go and work all day. Whereas now, because we don't work and we just sit, it's um, evolving and becoming, so some of that sort of stuff is coming back into people's training regimes as well, actually just mobilizing themselves and does that make sense? Yeah, yeah good point. Rambling shit. Good point. <laughs> and and it would, it'd be remiss of us not to say, <clears throat> 
the more the symmetry that, we get, yeah, the more that stuff will be important. Yeah, and also, like anything, you can have all the gear and no idea, can't you? But yeah, and I think that's probably, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the rule more than the exception. You know, people buy it for, because it's cool. Yeah. Um, because it might bring some more people into the gym. You know, if you're the only person in a 10 block radius that's got a reverse hyper um, and battle ropes, you know, that's something people are gonna, who want that, they have to come to you. Yeah, yeah. I, but for those, if, yeah. as you've got more and more varied equipment, as a coach, you've got to be across more and more yes. and more of it, and you have to understand the value and the use cases of that equipment the same way you do with, like, you know, a dumbbell yep. or a, a, a cable machine. Um, and I w w sort of worry that there's going to be sort of um, a an averaging of skill because there's more to learn. They're going to and and relatively and roughly the same amount of time available to learn that sort of stuff, you're gonna end up being less competent across the board, um, potentially. Definitely that potential there for that. But you wanna, for those people sort of looking to utilize this equipment, it's a good idea to seek out a coach or coaches or a training partner that knows where and when to put it into a training regime and why. And understand yeah, they need to be able to justify yeah, understand the why behind it. Um, if you're not interested in the why, just make sure you, you're technically proficient with the movements and the equipment before you use it. I, I really want to push back on the technically proficient thing, but it's going to add <laughs> another hour to this that, that we don't have. I agree with you in principle push I do push. I, I, I just think it's <laughs> gonna <laughs> no well, it, it, All right, it, go, it, 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 go it, for it I got coffee. half an hour it raises the uh, how do you know what what, what technically right and so this Correct. is it's like a whole bag of cats that there's a lot of as, assumptions there with what I said but it's hard to sort of because you know we can't very well go okay well let's start we could, but we don't have time now. Yeah. Let's start with a reverse hyper. Yeah. Let's, let's let's then go to GHD. Let's then go to the ropes. Let's then go to the yoke. Let's then go to the farmer's walk, dead balls, uh, wall balls, so on, kettlebells, so yeah. on and so on. We would have to go through every single piece. But um, generally speaking, you know, if you can seek out people that know how to use the equipment and why, you're going to be closer to having good technique than hopefully than having yeah. bad technique. Yeah, pick someone that can give you a credible explanation over someone that looks good training. I like that. Yep. <laughs> but if you get two that, together, use a hammerstring machine. What's that? Failing that, use a hammerstring. Yeah, if you're not sure, Cables, that's why those them. machines exist. They, and they're still in gyms now because they work. Yeah, we just cable machines work. here. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, we're gonna cut this off, otherwise we're gonna get back into equipment again. All good? Yep. All Cheers. Good. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you want to sign up for the August powerlifting competition at Real Fit, you can email alistair at realfit.com.au. That's A-L-I-S-T-A-I-R at R-E-A-L-F-I-T-T dot com dot A-U. If you want more info on powerlifting and the Australian Powerlifting Union, go to powerlifting-apu.com. If you want to check out Joe and Al's gym, Real Fit, head over to their website, realfit.com.au, and that's Real Fit with two Ts. Uh, you can sign up for online coaching as an individual or join a group and pick up supplements and training programs via their shop. If you want to get in touch, find me on Twitter at critical underscore coach, on Facebook at the critical coach, all one word, and on Instagram as the underscore critical underscore coach. Cheers.